Hi, I'm Kirk. Welcome to the McGee House and Steuben County Historical Society in Bath, New York. Uh, this is part two of our videos concerning slavery uh, here in Steuben County. And uh, it's basically uh, illustrations, as you'll see as we go along. These we promised along with the previous video. So let's take a look at what we have here. Uh, first of all, number 005, uh, Austin Stewart. And this is uh, Stewart in later life, uh, about the time he published his memoir in the 1850s. He was 22 years old when he escaped from slavery here in Steuben County. And uh, one of the things that's significant about this is it's the only image we know of of a person who had been enslaved here in Steuben. And uh, he had a remarkable life and remarkable career uh, as an abolitionist, uh, as an advocate, uh, as an entrepreneur and a businessman, and as a memoirist as well. Uh, the next image, 010, this is Charles Williamson's estate, uh, which stood out near Lake Salubria. Not, nothing left of it nowadays. And Williamson came here uh, in order to sell off 1.2 million acres of land. He was representing the British investors. And uh, he was perhaps the first person in Bath to bring in uh, an African-American slave, a man named Hans. He didn't have a large number of slaves himself, but he, he started that process. And uh, this certainly would have been familiar uh, to enslaved people at the time, and in fact to most anybody who was traveling through the area. Uh, it was very much a, a center of activity. And number 014 is uh, Colonel Williamson himself. Uh, Captain Williamson, when he came over for the revolution, a Scottish officer in the British Army, uh, was captured and spent the rest of the war in captivity. Uh, married an American and so gained American citizenship, uh, became a colonel in our militia. And then 015, uh, this building started out as a slave cottage on the Williamson property. Uh, they didn't have uh, photography back then. Slavery ended in New York in 1827. Uh, the building was later converted for farm use, uh, but it survived long enough uh, to be photographed, so we've got some picture of at one time, this building, configured a bit differently, uh, was a, a domicile for enslaved people on the Williamson property. Uh, the building's gone down, uh, gone now, uh, torn down, uh, knocked down in a windstorm, I should say. Uh, number 024, this is Dougald Cameron, also a, uh, uh, an immigrant from the British Isles, uh, became a prominent person here in uh, New York. And he also held slaves, a small number of slaves himself. On one occasion when he was sheriff of Steuben County, uh, he actually uh, seized an eight-year-old girl as property and sold her in order to pay a uh, debt, a judgment against her, her master's debts. And then uh, 025, uh, this is an early view of Bath. Uh, from a uh, French travelogue, actually. And one of the important things to it, uh, to us in it, is the bridge, which we can see in the foreground. And that bridge is on the same location as the bridge right outside of our McGee house here, uh, crossing the Conhocton River uh, with the village of Bath in the background. And why that's important is that Austin Stewart, whom we met earlier, uh, was crossing that bridge one night and crossing in the other direction was Daniel Kruger, who we can see here in number 026. Kruger was an attorney, uh, a noted attorney, according to uh, Stewart, and that was the case. He would later be representing us in Congress. And why that's significant is that uh, Stewart met Kruger on the bridge and stopped him and said, I've been doing some thinking and some studying and some listening, and it seems to me that under the laws of the state of New York, I actually ought to be free at this time. And Kruger loudly told him that was not the case, he was not free, but later on the two men met surreptitiously. And Kruger uh, pointed out to Stewart that legally he was correct, he should be free. And uh, he uh, helped uh, Stewart to get to the point where he could make his escape 
uh, walk away from slavery. Uh, Kruger also, uh, while he was in Congress, rescued a couple of local teenagers who had been kidnapped and were being sold in Virginia. Uh, he found them, rescued them, paid to send them back up here. Uh, they had been illegally taken away and be, were being illegally sold. On the other hand, he owned slaves himself, including uh, two of uh, Austin Stewart's cousins. So a perplexing kind of guy. Uh, and in number 027, we see a, uh, an ad that uh, uh, Austin Stewart's owner or master, uh, William Helm, ran uh, to, to uh, have him found and returned. And we know that he was chased and did have to escape. And eventually, uh, William Helm found him and tried to reclaim him when he was living and working up near Canandaigua. Uh, but by that time, he had secured legal representation uh, from the Manumission Society and was able to make his escape uh, stick. One interesting thing about this is the fact that uh, uh, William Helm, uh, noted for being lazy and alcoholic, uh, got Stewart's name wrong. It's actually Stewart, and he had it down here as Stewart. And uh, Austin Stewart went away with a woman named Millie, uh, who Helm identified as Nellie. So William Helm never quite uh, on track with reality, I think. Uh, number 030, the McBurney House, uh, later called the McGee House, uh, not our McGee House and a different spelling, not related. Uh, but the McBurneys who lived here were slave owners. And in fact, one of the McBurneys uh, legally acknowledged paternity of two slave children. Uh, after they died, a nephew uh, was their heir and took over the property and used the place as a station on the Underground Railroad. And also, uh, slave features of this uh, survived. Uh, the building itself as a whole is still standing, uh, changed quite a lot since those days. Uh, but zero through five, zero three five, uh, was photographed and identified as the kitchen in the slave quarters, and then 040 as the slave cemetery. We go on to 045, Nathaniel Rochester uh, lived in Steuben County for a few years, and uh, he's the Rochester for whom the city in Monroe County was later named. And uh, he owned slaves when he came up from Maryland. One of the things we know he did here is he went before town officials in Dansville and manumitted or emancipated two teenage slaves. And uh, number 050 is the home that Rochester was living in in those days, uh, moved from uh, what was then Dansville up to the Genesee Country Village and Museum. So you can still see that. Uh, 070 is John McGee, builder of the house where we are here. Uh, not a slave owner, as far as we've ever been able to tell. One of the reasons he was significant is that when he was sheriff of Steuben County, he employed a former slave, Simon Watkins, as a deputy. And uh, uh, Watkins uh, served in that role for a number of years under McGee and also 075 under the next sheriff, uh, Henry Brother. And so uh, Watkins actually was a very significant character in the uh, Bath area. Uh, from a number of perspectives. Uh, 080 is Constant Cook. His father in the Cohopton area was a significant slaveholder, uh, but Constant Cook not only did not own slaves, uh, but when he built a one-room school for the uh, children of his employees out of what's now the West End of Bath, uh, he also announced that any of the black children of Bath who wanted to could attend there as well. And that building actually is uh, still standing and still in use as a school. It's now the uh, head start uh, of Bath. We go to 085 and we find the Presbyterian Church, the original Presbyterian Church in Bath, the first First Presbyterian Church, if we like. And uh, then if we look at 090, we can see the pew map. In those days, uh, many churches rented the pews, or they called it sold the pews. It was part of the way of uh, raising the money for the upkeep uh, of the church. And we can see there a number 
of the names of uh, slave owners and slave holders. Uh, we can see the name of uh, Owls and Campbell and Cameron and Faulkner and so forth. And then if we go to 095, we can see the pew map of the second level, the gallery area. And the gallery area was traditionally where uh, slaves and non-white people sat. And one of the things that's particularly important about this to us is that this uh, shows us uh, the pew areas of Aunt Julia, Aunt Mimi, King Watkins, and George Alexander, all of them enslaved people. Now we can see a couple of things from this. First of all, the fact uh, that they were relegated to the gallery. Uh, but secondly, uh, the fact that since the end of slavery, these folks have done well enough to have some substantial uh, disposable income and be able to pay for their pews there at the Presbyterian Church. Uh, when the new church, the current church, was built in 1877, uh, they did away with the pew rental system and the uh, divided uh, seating altogether. Uh, formerly enslaved people were uh, active in a number of the Bath churches. They were among the official founders of the Bath Baptist Church. Uh, they were pew owners in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, they were active in the Episcopal Church. Uh, but then there was also an African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And in the 1890s, uh, they built a new edifice for themselves, and that still stands. Uh, the congregation petered out around the time of World War I and that is now the uh, Bath Grange Hall. And that uh, number 180, if we move to, uh, I'm sorry, number 100, if we move to number 109, then we get a view of Bath in the 1818 to 1820 period. And we can see the bridge over the Conhocton, same space where uh, Stewart accosted uh, Kruger. Uh, but if we look up Morris Street, the slanted street going up to the left, uh, near the end of Morris Street, we can find the house of Simon Watkins. Uh, started out as a slave, uh, became a deputy sheriff, uh, went into real estate and into retailing, and was a noted impresario, or sort of a uh, potty planner and organizer for a great many years. A uh, noted political figure, well known to people in Albany, uh, and did all that without, apparently without ever learning to read. Remarkable accomplishment. And there's a number of other names on here, both of former slaves and of uh, slave owners. And then if we move on, uh, number 110, this is a view of Bath in 1842, a parcel map of Bath. Why it's significant to us at this point, if we look over to the left, uh, just past Pine Street, uh, up near the uh, top of the map, uh, the one side of Pine and then below what was then St. Patrick Street, now Washington, we see a number of blocks marked Dorsey. And the Dorsey family was a former slave family uh, here in Bath uh, that did very well in real estate over the years. And among other things, maintained a large block uh, in Bath itself. And we go to an 1873 map. Uh, we can see Mrs. Dorsey. Uh, Mr. Dorsey had passed away by that time, but Mrs. Dorsey still had substantial holdings. Uh, but also, if we look around, smaller holdings for uh, Tolliver, uh, for instance, and Lucas, and others, a number of these are known surnames of enslaved people in Bath. So it appears that the Dorseys were uh, facilitating people to be able to either buy or possibly rent or lease properties uh, of their own here in Bath. And then if we look across Pine Street, we can uh, see Schoolhouse. And up until 1867, that had been specifically the school for African-American children. Uh, the Bath schools were integrated uh, by public vote in 1867. And after that, uh, the building was passed on to the black community for use as a church. And it was later replaced by, on the same site by the building we saw earlier that we said is now the Bath Range Hall. And then likewise, in uh, the uh, 1873 map, uh, once again, we can see the uh, Dorsey block up there as part of life in Bath at the time. Uh, so...
that pretty much uh, tells us or gives us the views that we have. However, we can also make mention of a few other people uh, not directly involved right here, uh, most of them in Stubend County. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, for instance, was never here. But the reason I brought him up is these are slavery fighters. These are people who opposed slavery and tried to end it. And Franklin was perhaps the first significant national figure, and in fact really one of the few significant national figures who to just outright call for the abolition of slavery. And in doing so, he thoroughly annoyed George Washington, who was president at the time and was trying to hold the whole thing together and didn't want the boat to be rocked by anything, including questions about abolition. Now, to give George uh, credit, he and Martha freed their slaves in their wills. Uh, and in fact, uh, between them, perhaps our, uh, uh, as individuals, uh, one of the uh, most significant groups of the couple uh, to free slaves as far as numbers of slaves are concerned. Uh, but Franklin uh, took the lead and then, <coughs> excuse me, in another generation, another New Yorker in the Rochester area, Frederick Douglass, uh, escaped from slavery and then established himself in Rochester and uh, around the country as a noted, cam noted campaigner against slavery. Uh, we believe he spoke once, anyway, here in Steuben County, uh, down around Cameron, just before the Civil War. <clears throat> uh, Susan B. Anthony, we think of her as a campaigner for women's rights. She was also a campaigner, uh, even a paid uh, campaigner against slavery. So she and Douglas were uh, colleagues, both in the fight for women's rights and in the fight against slavery. And then Austin Stewart, as we mentioned earlier, uh, kind of uh, bridging between the time of Franklin and the time of uh, Douglas and uh, Anthony. He also was a noted agitator and activist against slavery. And to come down a little bit closer, uh, Robert Troop, for whom our town of Troopsburg was named, uh, was the president of the Anti-Slavery Society in New York City. So along with several other people, Troop is responsible for the law uh, which finally abolished slavery in New York. It took years of campaigning and agitation at, on their part. And along with Robert Troop, Aaron Burr, our third vice president, was also part of that group who fought against slavery. John Jay, our first chief justice. And Alexander Hamilton, our first secretary of the treasury. So all of these men uh, did things that I'm sure they were later sorry about, and certainly that we're later sorry about and disapprove of, uh, but at the same time we need to give them credit and a round of applause for what they did do. And uh, they fought it through the courts, and they fought it through the legislature, and they fought it in the court of public opinion as well. And they finally got a law in place, uh, which was uh, completed later on, uh, for gradual emancipation and in 1827, the official end of slavery in New York. So that's the uh, images that we have. Like I say, it was a period before photography, so the images are a little bit limited, but uh, we're delighted we were able to find as much as we did. Thank you for joining us.